Last week we had a bit of problem with the recording, which is highly unusual for the setup that we have, but we begin getting electronic interference, and so I'm going to have to retape last week. But we've remodulated everything, we scanned all the frequencies to make sure there was no feedback anywhere. And uh, how many know God wants to do a thing this morning, and I think uh, He's already done it to a certain extent. God's been talking to me a lot about being established in truth. We're, we're living in an age that truth is being attacked in unprecedented ways. On, on every front, it's being attacked. And uh, so I want to get into some things this morning, and, and this, this is probably going to take a while to get into, so I want you just to sit back and relax, and let's just get into the Word. Huh. It doesn't want to, there we go. I thought I was going to have to beat it there for a minute. This is the Apostle Paul, and I think one of the best New Testament books about the realities of who we have become in Messiah is the book of, of, Eph of Ephesians. Paul spent several years in Ephesus just teaching them day in and day out. And so, how I many know that if you've really spent some time taking people deep in the, in the ways of God, you can get deep when you write them. Sometimes, you know, I, I look at the book of Hebrews where he said, I wanted to take you on, but I couldn't take you on because you could barely swallow what I was giving you now. But the Apostle Paul knew they understood some things, and so he lays out a lot of very, very powerful things in the book of Ephesians. And then he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that. Something's coming, church. Something's coming. Something's going on behind the scenes that you really don't understand what's going on. But one of the things where we know is that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we kind of look at that and we, and we think, well, I don't even, when was the last time you heard wiles even mentioned except somebody quoting the book of Ephesians? That's not really a word that we use anymore. In Strong's, it is methodia in the Greek. We get the word method from it. How many know there's a method to the devil's madness? He is methodical about his attack on your life. It means cunning, arts, uh, deceit, craftiness, trickery. If he can't come in from, from your head on, he comes in on you sideways. He likes to sneak in a back window. He likes to, whatever way he wants to do it, he's crafty about it. He's very methodical about it, and he does not give up easily. If you don't understand the enemy, you're not going to be prepared for how he works. The devil never goes to sleep. He never says, okay. I'm just going to leave you alone for the rest of your life. He didn't even do that to Jesus. Now, after the, after the 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus put, took up a big Torah stick and just absolutely beat the snot out of the devil. Now, the devil did not leave him alone for the next three and a half years. It said he left him alone for a season, but he always comes back. He always comes back. He's very crafty about it. Jesus even found him speaking through his apostles. He looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. How many know that's not necessarily an endorsement for ministry? He's sneaky about it. Now, Dake goes on to say that it's methods that different means, plans, and schemes used to deceive, entrap, enslave, and run the souls of men. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Listen, he's working in all society. He's working every angle that he can possibly think of in your life to sneak in there to bring you captive. And if you don't understand that, you'll just relax. You'll not be on guard. The Bible talks about that we're supposed to be vigilant or ever, ever watchful. We need to be watchful to see what God's doing. We need to be watchful to see what the devil's doing. And if we don't, we're always going to end up in trouble. Now, I'm going to take this just a little bit deeper. This is from the Complete Biblical Library. It says, in the New Testament, methodia is used in two places, Ephesians 4.14 and 6.11. Both are in an unfavorable sense. 
In Ephesians 4.14, methodia is used as a reference to those individuals who deliberately, skillfully, and maliciously plan and develop a strategy of error to circumvent, distort, confuse, or deceive the followers of Christ so they might lure them away from the true faith. How many know that's still going on in pulpits today? That's still going on in seminaries today. That's still going on in a lot of different places today. Many times you'll find them on the airwaves, somehow uh, deceit and deceitfulness, things that tickle the ear make more money than telling people the truth because sometimes the truth is hard. In Ephesians 6.11, Methodia refers to those schemes, strategies, wiles, and tactics the devil himself uses to make war and to destroy the believers. Sounds to me like the devil is going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you don't get that truth, there's so much of the truth of the word that you're not going to be able to put into place. In fact, I think that in verse 10, where Apostle Paul says, put on the whole armor, you're putting on something to stand against. Most believers spend their entire Christian walk running around on the battlefield in their BVDs. I remember we were listening to L.A. Marzulli last night. He, goes, he, says, he says, I'm just amazed at the, he didn't use ineptitude, but I kind of threw that in there, of so many believers in churches. He'll go into a church, three, four, five hundred, and say, how many prayed and put, out their, put on their armor today? He may get five, six hands out of three to five hundred people. What armor? What am I supposed to put on? And, you know, you can even say, I put on the armor of God and never really do it because it's actually things that you do. It's how you live your life. It's how your prayer life is activated. It's things you stand. God functions in the universe based upon three things, his thoughts, his words, and his actions. Therefore, I put on the armor of God. I function in this world based upon my thoughts, my words, and my actions. And where you really tap into God's power is when you think his thoughts, you speak his word, and you do his actions. Power flows. Now, what the devil tries to do, he tries to get you to think his thoughts, speak his words, and do what he wants you to do so that his power can be charged in what you do. But when you put on the the armor of God, that put is so critical. It's the only way to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. No other way. Now, who's the fight with? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. How many glad it in the world to come? They're just limited to this world. Every once in a while, even, even reading something rough like this, you get a happy point right here. You're, you're locked in just to this world, in the world to come, in the kingdom to come. You're not there. I don't know about you, but that just gives me Holy Ghost goosebumps. That just makes me happy. Satan, you're limited. There's a kingdom coming. You can't interfere with it anyway. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, all these uh, different levels of satanic power... They affect nations, internationally. I mean, there's a lot of international craziness going on in the world today. One of the ones that blows me away is the hatred for Israel. It's smaller than what's the size of Rhode Island. It's a little speck compared to all the other nations, not just there, but in the world. And yet anti-Semitism is raising up like never before to this itty-bitty plot of land, to this itty-bitty group of people. You know why? God says, you know, I'm going to bring you back to the land. I'm going to establish you that you're never going to cease from the earth. If the devil can stop that from happening, he makes all the promises of God null and void. But there's a, there's, there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that are inciting international hatred for Israel today like never before. Not only do they do things internationally, but they do things nationally. How many know right now America's kind of stuck on stupid? And you look at it and say, no rational human being reason would dictate you don't do that. It's impossible. Just some of the things they're proposing, they're spending us into oblivion 
while trying to create a social agenda that is unsustainable. It would take the entire global GDP to fund what they'd like to fund every year. How many know America doesn't have the wealth of the world? It doesn't produce everything in the world. It doesn't make all the money in the world. So it's unreasonable. But yet there is another force pushing their minds toward these things. We can see this in the state. Last night I saw our governor. It's one of the few times I said, Mary, it's, it's time that we, we, we pray somebody out of office. Our legislative uh, branch here in Missouri passed legislation that said the federal, federal government cannot pass any law that would do away with uh, our, our Second Amendment rights to, be, to bear arms and that if any federal officer would try to impede that, then they're guilty of a crime. Our governor vetoed it. You know what, Christians? You better get up off your blessed assurance and pray and vote. That's right. Because voting like that is done by another spirit. Yeah. It can work in our city. How I many know there's a lot of spiritual forces working in Marshfield, Missouri right now, just like they're working in Springfield and other cities, that you have drugs, you have family violence, you have families falling apart. That's all done because there's principalities and, and rulers of darkness and all these things going on. And it can come on an individual level. Now, we read over that, but what we skip over is the word wrestle. I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> I've not done a lot of wrestling. I remember when I was in junior high, and I was going to try out for the wrestling team. I thought, I'm so skinny, ain't nobody can even get a hold of me hardly, you know. I turn sideways and disappear. <laughs> I, was, I was that skinny. Kind of hard to believe now, isn't it? See, there, there are signs and wonders, and I guess I'm one of them. And the first night out, watching them do their thing, a guy moved forward and snapped the guy's leg in three places, and I said, I'm out. <laughs> it could be my neck as skinny as I am. I guess you have to have some muscles here or there, you know what I mean? There, there's wrestling, and if you've ever watched a, a wrestling match, you're, you're strategizing and you're watching you're the other guy who's doing the same thing and you're looking for a place of advantage to throw them off balance. If you can throw them off balance, you can take advantage of them and you can pin them down. So that is the word the Apostle Paul uses. He uses the word pala in, in the Greek, which means to wrestle a contest between two in endeavor to throw the other, and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down uh, with his hand upon his neck. I don't know about you, but I like to have my hand upon the devil's neck and not to have his hand upon my neck to where I'm powerless and can't give up. And so all these things, are they're, they're involved in wrestling with you, constantly looking to find a place of advantage that they can get you off balance. And I have met too many believers that are off balance. The devil has snuck something in. And the whole time we're oblivious to the wrestling of the devil. Uh, guys, I have seen believers that they're so used to curses. They're so used to everything falling apart. They're so used to being sick all the time. They're so used to never, ever anything working out in their lives. They think that's normal. And so when you start talking about the blessings of God, the wrestler in their ears says, but that's not for you. You, you, you. you can never have that. You can never be that. And they look at those of us who have struggled to try to get to a place of blessing, and they look at us as that we're an enigma. When we're not an enigma, it should be normal. But it's hard to know what normal is when the enemy has wrestled you down, he has your hand on your neck and has you pinned to a reality he created for you. The good news is Jesus wants to set you free. Because of this wrestling, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. I love his terminology. Because as long as you're wrestling, if you're standing, you can always keep your balance. It's when you're on all fours, you're on the floor, and you can't do anything that you're at a disadvantage. 
He's saying here, when I take on the whole armor of God, I need that so that I can be able to withstand that evil day when the enemy comes in like a flood and I'm needing the Lord to lift up a standard against him. I need to have that whole armor on. And if I have that whole armor on, I am able to maintain my balance. The first function of the armor of God in your life is to give you balance. If you don't have balance, you can't fight. I remember when, did you ever see the, the, the baton things they, they fight with in the, in the military when they're, when they're training and everything? And it, it took a lot of us a while to figure out just how not to get knocked flat on our backs. Can I be honest with you? And there's this one guy that, no, that our drill sergeant couldn't even knock down. And the drill sergeant says, you have an uncanny sense of balance. I can't get you off balance. If I can't get you off balance, I can't knock you down. Oh, you're not hearing me this morning. If the devil can't get you out of balance, he can't knock you down. If he can't get you out of the balance of the kingdom and of the word and of the spirit of God, he can't get an advantage on you. And that armor is all about enabling you to maintain your balance. And then it is a defensive and offensive weapon. But you can have the best weapon, guys. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, you can have the best weapon, but if you can't maintain your balance, it will never work. That's right. You'll never get a chance to use it. I don't care if it's nunchucks. I don't care if it's a, a staff. I don't care what it is. If you can't keep your balance, right. you'll go down with the best weapons ever formed by man right. in your hands. That's right. And right now, the body of Christ has no balance where it cannot stand. Am I making sense this morning? Oh, yeah. Okay. Look here in Ephesians 6, 14. I, I, what I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to build a foundation because it's going to be well for us to, to get into these things. It says, stand therefore, having your loins gird with truth. Now, you know, I remember when I first learned about this, about the warfare, the armor, I just started from the top down. I have the helmet of salvation on my head, I have the breastplate of righteousness my you can't do that if you don't have truth. You can't put the rest of it on. Right. If it doesn't start in truth and end in truth, you're naked spiritually. So we need to understand right now that the number one tactic of the enemy, the number one wild, the stratagem of the enemy is he is attacking truth. I even had one guy stand in my office one day, and he tried to wax very Greco-Roman on me. What is truth? Well, you don't try to share it with the doorpost. <laughs> Come on. Truth is being attacked, and here are some of the strategies the enemy is using today. Denying truth. Do you know a lot of our forefathers that established this nation denied truth? They, they were part of the Renaissance. They were enlightened thinkers. They went by reason. And so if they read anything in the Word of God, if it wasn't reasonable, they didn't believe it. That's why in the, in the Jeffersonian Bible, he takes out the virgin birth, the miracles, the resurrection of the dead. And to him, being a Christian was following just the moral teachings of Jesus. But he would also embrace the moral teachings of Confucius and Zoeaster and, and, and Salon and a lot of these different people. How many know that's not being a Christian? But these same guys, and I, I've shared this with you before, when you look on the, on the inside of the rotunda, there's something called a, a fresco called the Apotheosis of George Washington. So the same guys that, that worshipped reason, that dismissed everything out of the Bible, could never understand how God could become flesh. Believe that if you became a mighty enough man in the earth that you became a god after you died. How many know that that, that, is, that is called intellectual dishonesty? They attacked 
truth. Truth is being attacked on every front. It's being attacked in our universities. It's being attacked in our seminaries. It's being attacked on television. It's being attacked in in comedy. It's being attacked almost in every single front around us. Truth is being attacked. They're trying to replace it with something else. But there's something, I would rather somebody come out and say, I just don't believe in that book. I got something to work with. But we're having like it's, it's in the days of Elijah. I mean, there were neat things happening in the life of Elijah, but the rest of what was going on in the northern tribes, it was going to hell in a handbasket. Because they took the worship of Jehovah and they blended it with the worship of Baal. And they would, they would actually call Jehovah Baal and, and Baal Jehovah. It got so bad that finally God had one of the prophets call out and say, don't call me Baal anymore. And so the, those priests of Baal would, would blend paganism in and they, and they would begin redefining what this is. Now, most of the church can't really gripe at what's going on in the church case because we've been doing it for, for centuries. We've redefined the feasts of the Lord into something else. We've re- How many of us have had, you know, you, sh- you share people black and white, you give them two or three, four, five, 10, 15, 40 witnesses out of the word of God, and they'll say, but that's not what it means to me. I'm wanting to ask, well, who gives a flying cow what you think? I don't care what Almighty God thinks. He never asked you about it. So what they do is they redefine it. Well, if a guy can redefine pork, it's the new white meat. It's the other white meat. They raise it different. It's okay now. Then we can redefine marriage. I mean, no, that's kind of going on right now. Where if we redefine marriage, we can actually re- redefine adultery. There's no such thing as adultery. The guy just has a lot of love to give. I'm not really lying because I said that to, to do a greater good. The ends justify the means. That's what's going on in Washington right now. We have temples of Baal calling themselves churches that redefine sin and say it's not sin anymore. God really didn't mean that. But, you know, if you take this, you shake it around, you add this to it, you look at it sideways with one eye squinted, you can see that it means this. That's redefining truth. We don't need it redefined. We need to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Satan is also blinding people to the truth. I've sat there and sat down with ministers that I know, know exegesis, know the Greek and the Hebrew, that know hermeneutical process. And so I take them through the hermeneutical process, guys. I've done this. I got a guy, a Ph.D. sitting there with a five-year-old kid sat next to him, and the kid gets it, and the Ph.D. doesn't. Why? Because Satan blinds the minds. He blinds them to truth. Not only does he blind them to truth, there are many of what I call the cult of the willfully ignorant. All I know is Jesus loves me and I don't need to know anything else and I choose to put my fingers in my ears and go la, 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 la. God's not going to require anything of me. So you get in the kingdom and you sit down. How many know that's an insult to the king of kings? You get into the kingdom and you live the rest of your life in spiritual pampers. Now, how many know when they're, when they're six months old, that's cute, but when they're 60, it gets to be a mess? We, we cannot deny truth. Now, how do we know the truth? These are some basic things. How do we know the truth? Jesus said, and then he said to those Jews who believed in him, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We always like to quote verse 32, but we never do 31. I've got to abide in his word. Now, who is this speaking? Jesus of Nazareth, who is he? He is yod Hey vav Hey. He is the great I am come in the flesh. So his word starts where? Genesis. If I abide in his word, if I stay in the word, I don't argue with the word. I dwell with that word. I let the word change me. It's the way of Baal to change the word. It's the way of the kingdom for the word to change me. 
This word here, continue. Mino means to remain, to abide in reference of a place to sojourn, to tarry, to not depart, to continue, to be present. Be present in the word. Stay in the word. I don't care if a million experts that all have alphabet soup behind their name get up on television and tell you why this is not the word of God. Now you're being tested. Are you going to abide in the word or are you going to abide in the wisdom of men? The apostle Paul talks about them, that they're every learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They profess profess themselves to be wise, yet they become as fools. It takes spiritual discernment. You can't see the kingdom until you're born again. And many of our forefathers rejected the miracles of the word, rejected the instruction of the word, because they couldn't see it because they weren't born again. If you reject Jesus, it's impossible for you to be born again. And let me tell you something. I have met a lot of professional clergymen and a lot of professional academians that were functioning within seminaries and Bible colleges that did not know Jesus. There's a lot of pastors today. They can't teach what they're teaching if they knew him. Because if they did, their eyes would be open. I love this on truth. You see, truth, we don't need to wax philosophical. Oh, brother, what is truth? Look at this. Objectively, what is true in any matter and consideration, truly in truth, according to truth of a truth. I love this next one. In reality. In reality. You see, there's a lot of things the devil has sold you about you that's not true. How many know that you could hypnotize me and convince me that I was a short, skinny man? And I would be convinced that I would sit there and things would be right here and I couldn't reach them because I wasn't tall enough because in my own mind, I have been convinced that I'm a short, skinny man. Now, how many know that's not reality? There's a lot of things the devil has convinced all of us about from our past, what other people have said about us. Has anybody ever had anybody say a hateful word to you? Chew you out about something you didn't do? Say all manners of evil against you falsely? What were they doing? They were trying their their bondages and they were, the, the, the enemy was wrestling with you to get you to accept an unreality as truth. Your past is not who you are in reality. If you have made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, your past is not who you are because the word says that you have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so what we have got to do when I embrace truth, I begin to learn the reality of who I am now. Not what has happened to me, not what I came out of, not what other people say about me, but who Jesus says that I am because he is the way, the what? Truth. He's the way. Now, in in that truth, it's, I'm reality. I'm reality. You're created in the image of God. Why is this so important today? They're teaching us materialism. Well, Mike, that's just having stuff. No, 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 no. Materialism involves evolution and all these different things. That all you are is a highly evolved animal. That's what the world teaches. And so for those in control, you're nothing more than a cow or a goat or a sheep. They get you to make money so they can share a lot of it off of you and get you to buy things that you really don't need and all these different things. They're shearing the sheep. But what happens when the, pasture, when the, when the flock get too big for the pasture? They cull the flock. Have no thought about it. Just cull the flock. What does that mean? Time to go to the butcher. Today we call it abortion. One way. 
There are plans to greatly reduce this population on this planet. Their goal is 500 million worldwide. That's kind of rough for when you're in a world of 6 billion plus. And how many know none of them are volunteering to go? Because they have bought a lie. It's all material. You were not created in the image of God. You were just a futuristic expression of an amoeba that finally grew legs and crawled out of some lake or river somewhere that developed intelligence. You're just one chromosome away from being a monkey. That's what they're teaching our kids. The reality is we're all created in the image of God. There is dignity and there is a preciousness to all life. And what the devil tries to do is he tries to take away that dignity. He tries to, there is something unique in you that if God can ever get the devil off and his kingdom established, he wants to bless you and make you a blessing just like he did Abraham. That's truth. Now for some in this world, that's an inconvenient truth because everything is wrestling to stop you from realizing who you are, who Jesus is, what the kingdom is, and what he's called us to do. We are deceived, we are confused, we are dazed, and the Holy Spirit is trying to bring us to reality. There's so much potential in you guys. It's, it's, with all of us, it's unbelievable. God wants to return us to the reality of who he is. He is not a God, he is the God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He created the one that has become duplicious and lied and said that I am the great architect of the universe. No, you're not. You can't hardly extend what you're doing beyond this planet. You didn't create anything. All you did is pervert. We need to realize, here's another one, guys. Is Jesus different than the God of the Old Testament? Most of the church says yes. There was the age of law, now there's the age of grace. Even though there's five books of law and five is the biblical number for grace, but let's forget that inconvenient truth. And they do all these things and, and they get very Marcionistic about what they do. There's even a major Pentecostal denomination now saying the, that Yahweh of the Old Testament is an evil pagan god and that Jesus came to conquer him. That's what Marcion taught. Jesus is the Almighty, the Holy One of Israel, come in the flesh. He is yod Hey vav Hey that took, on, that took on flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the same God. Jesus to told Noah, uh, Moses, get a pen. I got five books I want you to write. I'm just going to dictate them to you. Uh, these I really want to make a point, so I'm going to go ahead and carve them out of the side of Mount Sinai, and I'm going to go ahead and inscribe them with my own hand by my own finger. And I'm just going to give you the job of carrying them down. Jesus is the God who visited Abraham, who caused Sarah to conceive, who split the Red Sea, who brought Pharaoh to his knees, that gave King David an anointing to bring Goliath to the ground and to cut off his head. It's that Jesus, just simply in physical form, he, he made a body for himself and he filled it with, all, with himself. And it's that Jesus who loved us so much that he gave himself for us on the cross and rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He said, when I'm high and lifted up, you will see that I am. Did we sing that a lot this morning? Jesus wants to bring us back to reality of what he's done. The cross was not a band-aid. It was a revolution. It was a transformation. It was something the devil would never have thought was possible. Man was born again again. Because the first time man was born again was in the garden when he took on the nature of Satan. But now he's taken on the nature of Almighty God who came in the flesh and humbled himself to his own will. He made the flesh do the will of the Father. And see, if I trust in him, I now have an anointing to make the flesh do the will of the Father. Who you are now. 
who you are now. That's a big one, guys. I uh, got to meet Dr. Michael Shreve when he, he and I were doing a conference up in Cleveland, Tennessee. And he just wanted to do a work. This, this, he took from the New Testament what Jesus did for us and who we are in him. It was called uh, Our Divine Inheritance. It took 12 volumes to complete. Now, I'm not talking about itty-bitty books. You can, these, these are two, three, four hundred page books. It took him 12 volumes just to articulate who we have become in Christ. Do you think the new birth is a small thing? Do you think the authority we have in the name of Jesus is a small thing? Do you think the anointing is a small thing? Do you think that new creation that we have and, and to be able to walk in the kingdom is a small thing? It can bring all of hell to its knees when I begin having confidence and begin functioning in who I am now. Not who I used to be, who I am now. And God wants us to return to a reality of how the kingdom works. How many know the commandments have a very functional role in the kingdom of God? The feasts have a very functional role in the kingdom of God. The Sabbath has a very functional role in the kingdom of God. Prayer has a very functional role in the kingdom of God. The blood of Jesus has a very functional role in the kingdom of God. The anointing of the Holy Ghost has a very functional role in the kingdom of God. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has a very functional role in the kingdom of God. All these things are realities that we barely scratch the surface of and think we've gotten deep. I have seen people blood washed, blood bought, spirit filled, speak in tongues that if you get more than a little toe in the kiddie pool, they think they're drowning. I want to learn how to get off in the things of God where I can jump on the deep end of the pool and swim in the great things of God. I want to get so deep that the devil's going to be afraid he's drowned to, he'll drown to get to me. That's where we need to be. That's what God is calling us to because while the whole world is going into a spiritual unreality, God is calling us to his reality. That's what he wants to establish. That's where we're headed. That's what the Spirit... And I, I tell you what, we have had more people... Uh, over in, in the body of Christ with Benefield and so many others, just God is, is like he's reading the devil's mail. He says, here's the strategy of the evening. Who's your, here's who you are to overcome it. How about divorcing Baal? Since this, the, the strong man over America is Baal. That's what every mason, when they dedicate a building, they do a ritual dedicating that, their cornerstone to Baal. It's a ritual from Baal that they do. D.C. was dedicated to Baal. I mean, no, D.C. is not my headquarters of where I'm governed from. It's from the very throne room of God. And we need to begin functioning that way. This is my instruction book. It's the history of how much of a mess I was in, what God did to get me free, and who I am now. And warning me about the battle to come. And if I find out who I am now, I can withstand, I can stand in that evil day. And I think each one of us, I think there's an evil day coming defined in prophecy. But I think it, with each one of us, there is an evil day the enemy has planned where everything in your life falls apart and you become shipwrecked. And if I learn who I am in Christ, I can stand that evil day. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, I ask that you would give us such a hunger for truth that it begins to permeate every single part of our life. Your word says, blessed are those who hunger in truth after righteousness sake, for they shall be filled. And Father, we, we ask that you would feed that hunger within us to know who we are and let it replace every single lie of the devil in the weeks to come, Father, but not only in the weeks to come, but Father, in our private devotion time. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to share with us your truth and to make the word of God come alive. Let us connect all the dots. Let us see the reality of who Jesus is how the kingdom functions, and who he has made us, we ask in Jesus' name.